Today we're going to delve into the world of structural engineering and to understand how structural engineers contribute to the built environment and the communities of which we live in. Today I'm joined by Mark from AWA. Mark, can you introduce yourself and tell us a little bit about more about AWA? Yeah, thanks Jamie and thanks for having me on. I've, um, I've actually been keeping up with a lot of your video content and find it really Thank interesting and, and yeah, useful to, to, to listen to what other construction professionals are saying. I suppose the journey that I've been on and AWA is almost a similar one because I've been there for so long. Um, I joined AWA when I was 19, which is 19 years ago, almost to the day. Um, joined as a junior structural technician. Um, didn't know my way around the construction industry at all. Um, really fresh faced and just, just willing to learn. And, um, you know, within the first six months, I, I felt like uh, this is a really interesting profession and why not take it as far as I can? So um, I did some part-time learning, HNC at Solent. Uh, that was for two years and then on to an undergraduate degree at Kingston University. That was part-time as well for, for four years. On to Portsmouth University to do a master's. That was another two years. So it's kind of the long route, but um, at the same time, I was I was learning on the job. And yeah, so achieved my master's and yeah, within kind of the next six or seven years so i was lucky enough to be offered the, the opportunity to to take ownership of the company with my business partner andy and um yeah here, here we are so um so fantastic so so when when you sort of um left school was structural engineering on your radar or how how did that initial kind of falling falling or choosing the path of structural engineering how did that come about so it wasn't it wasn't something I knew of. It wasn't a, a, a job that I had in mind. Um, I went to college. Um, I kind of studied biology. Um, um, I did some um, work with design technology. I was always quite fond of design and designing things and then making them. Um, but yeah, I, I suppose I, I didn't have um, a really defined direction at that point, but I had an opportunity um, for, for, for an interview at at AWA, as I said, didn't really know what structural engineer was, but but um, you know, even during the interview, I thought this is something that I think I can I can use my my kind of tendency to want to solve problems, um, and yeah, it, it really went on from there. But um, there's kind of two different routes that you can take with structural engineering to become a structural engineer. The route I went, which is the on-job learning and the long route, um, but you are one not building up. The, the debt that university does mm -hmm. does does lead to and also you're, you're learning as you go you're part of the industry and I think that's put me in a really good position for the rest of my career um, you know when I look back on 19 years I've done every job within within that practice within the industry so what better place to come from as the owner of the company to I don't know let's say build a fee quote we need to consider how long it will take to draw to design to project manage well I've done all of those things so you know in pretty good position to put that number um, together um, th there is a shorter route which is to go full-time study um, but yeah I, I the, the route I went was was clearly the slightly longer one but the but the on-job learning version yeah yeah, I mean, I, I, there are several routes and we, we'll probably come on to those in a bit because I think there'd be people interested in maybe becoming a structure engineer and want to know what those routes look like. I guess, I mean, I did the HNC route and you choose what best suits you, right? So there's no pros and cons. It's actually down to the individual and circumstances, I guess. That's right. So you, you've said you've been 19 years at AWA. That obviously says a lot for the company. Um, to stay there for, for that amount of time, you don't. That's quite <laughs> rare nowadays. So, just tell us a little bit more about AWA and, and what what they do. Okay, so we're civil and structural engineers, also marine engineers, which is um, a discipline that we've added fairly recently. Um, we're twenty two strong now, and we've recently opened a practice in Bath, just a couple of days ago, in fact, that that, that opened, and um, we. We really like to diversify with our engineering. We don't have um, a particular industry sector or particular material that we specialize in. Um, 
we we really cover anything industrial commercial residential like i said marine um and material wise timber concrete masonry steel work um modern methods you know you name it we we will we will design engineer it um and i think that's what um has kept me at awa for so long that the diversity of the work that i get involved in is just just it's so interesting um no two days are the same and i think that's what's kept me there and i think that's what also draws um new staff towards us i i i, I often um, talk to people about the kind of work that we do and they're really really impressed and and, and really uh drawn towards the idea of for example working on a church one day um working on a sheet pile wall in a marina the next day um that that as an engineer is exactly what you want to hear because um you know working on the same kind of structures or the same materials over and over again it doesn't allow you to kind of spread your wings and um and, and improve your knowledge of of engineering generally so interesting what um what led to um awa opening the bath office so bath um is a university city um it's got got a really good uh, engineering um degree master's degree there which instantly means there's a lot of candidates for, for to fill that office um not only that we were finding that um geographically we're starting to push 50 to 100 miles from the Romsey office and quite often in that kind of northwest direction so we did feel that it was a great opportunity to not only be a short distance from some great candidates but also to be a short distance from some 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 great clients and um and and that gap between kind of Romsey and Bath is somewhere we operate anyway and is um in in the profession then obviously opening the bath office um like a lot of maybe other professions consultants in the construction industry are, are you guys finding it's busy out there at the moment or how's 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 balancing the workload at the moment yeah fortunately we're we're really busy um which is which is a great problem to have yeah. <laughs> and um yeah and and that and that works coming from all different directions really um it it's not like one industry is particularly strong at the moment that's from my experience um which again i think is, is a good place for the industry to be in okay fantastic look that's a great intro to yourself thank you very much and, and awa so let's just some um, just start with some basic stuff and then get into some more technical stuff around structural engineering so let's let's start with the real basic one what do structural engineers do so the, the short answer to that is structural engineers uh, design buildings or structures so they stand up um, the slightly longer answer is that we can we consider the the material and its properties the loads applied the stresses that are created by those loads and ensure that the the structure performs as it should in a safe manner um, often what we're trying to do is take the loads whether they be gravity loads imposed loads wind loads um, and we try and transfer those into the ground. That's, that's. Um, I, I think that's the crux of of engineering is to try and get those loads safely through into the ground, um, and that can be done in many different ways. Um, you know, we we can use different kind of stability systems, frames. Um, you know, we've got columns, piers. Um, we can use girders trusses you know, there's, there's really many ways that we can carry load to where we want to carry it to and then transfer that into the ground that, that's yeah. it, i think in a nutshell thank you that's a great explanation and as i said certainly for for viewers who, who may not know what structure engineering is so that's a really great explanation um is there a difference between a structure engineer and a civil engineer or is um structure engineering a component of civil engineering just just to clear that one up for mm. everyone watching this video yeah i think you're right that structural engineering is um is part of civil engineering as a, as a whole is a, a as a profession as as an occupation um structural engineering focuses on as it says in the title that the structure and is often building related whereas civil engineering is tends to be more based upon infrastructure um infrastructure for the built environment we're talking roads bridges 
things like that where it's structural engineering more towards buildings yeah thanks man that's again another great explanation so we touched on it earlier around um the process of becoming a structural engineer and you talked about obviously the hnc route is there a sort of a, a prescribed route to becoming a structural engineer how how does somebody leave in school um how would they go about becoming a structural engineer i think there's yeah as we touched on earlier there's two distinct routes one kind of working and learning and the other going through university in that direction um and the professional bodies i see and i T do set out some fairly clear pathways um in essence they are to firstly obtain uh, a degree um a postgraduate degree and then move on to some professional development um so uh ipd so independent professional development is it's a portfolio that you put together for either the ic or the istructi which is a is it a collection of your work and your experiences um that you can then present to the board and the and the judging panel and show that really you're in a position um where you can take lead on projects and produce safe buildings and structures um the i struct t route famously um end in a rather arduous seven hour exam which um yeah it, it's quite well renowned for being a tricky one um less than 50 percent pass rate and yeah that, that's uh that's one that a lot of engineers aim for I'm very proud when when they achieve ICE um you you will follow a similar route rather than finishing in an exam there's a a presentation to give in front of a panel um also very rigorous and and um, not inferior to the ice track team. So you that that's really interesting. So you mentioned the ICE, which is the Institute of Civil Engineers, and I struck which I think is the Institute of Structural Engineers. Um, so is that to suggest very similar to architects that you have to pass those professional qualifications in order to call yourself a structural or civil engineer, or can you be a civil or structural engineer without being a member of those professional institutes? The accreditation isn't a, a prerequisite to, to to work in the profession or, or call yourself those things um and there's many very good civil and structural engineers out there who have you know worked in the industry for such a long amount of time that they are more than capable of you know producing um safe efficient buildings so yeah it's not a prerequisite but um it it does show that you've achieved you know that accreditation and there is kind of a baseline ability that comes along with that so mark how do structure engineers deal with the impact of climate change and their imp and that impact on um structures and the design of structures it's, it's interesting one one aspect that really springs to mind when we talk about climate change is that is actually drainage uh, engineering which is an arm of civil engineering um so with the increased rainfall that we receive now and the increased, increased intensity of that rainfall, um, the surface runoff um, that we're getting um, in, in the built environment is, is, is more intense than it ever has been. So the design of, of, of how we take that water from the built environment and, and put it back into the land um, has, has now got a factor built into it for climate change actually which is which is 40 percent in excess of the calculated rainfall so that's allowing for a future increase which is quite considerable mm. oh that's really interesting wow I, I, I didn't i would never have thought of something like that mm. um okay so then moving on um in terms of sustainability how how, how does sustainability impact upon structural engineering design and innovation well I think that all of us in the construction industry have got a huge responsibility when it comes to sustainability and carbon emissions. Um, I, was, I was just re reading yesterday that the built environment um, contributes forty percent of carbon emissions globally. Now, that's a that's a huge impact, yeah. and half of that forty percent is made up of steel and concrete. Now, as structural engineers, steel and concrete are some of our most familiar tools to use. Um, and I think that really puts an onus on us to consider 
whether we should be using those materials, whether there's alternatives that we can use. Um, and I think to allow us to do that, we need to be invited to the conversation a little earlier than we are at the moment. Um, I've got a, an example of that was um, we were appro approached by a, a private client with a, a design in hand of, of a, a large country estate. And the question was put to us, you know, how do we make this a sustainable project? You know, make this green, essentially. Now, this was a fairly classical looking building, large spans, high ceilings, flat ceilings. It didn't lend itself to us being able to switch the construction materials to sustainable materials such as timber, because there are certain constraints that come along with the use of those materials Large spans, for example, in let's say glue laminated timber, they are going to require increased depth of section just because of the stiffness properties of, of that material. If a client doesn't want to see large downstands in their ceiling, um, downstands being the protrusion from the flat ceiling, then a switch to that, that material isn't really on the table. So if we were invited to that conversation at inception of the project, I think we could have made that known and maybe the property itself could have been designed in a different way to allow for greener materials to be used. So it sometimes feels like when we're invited to the conversation, our hands are a little bit tied um, and then we seem to be forced down the steel route, um, the concrete route because um, of the geometry of the building really. And, and stick with sustainability and when you're looking at um the design of a certain structure or a building are you considering are you considering um dismantling or deconstruction of that building and how that looks from a sustainability environmental point of view i think it's important that we do consider that kind of thing and um many building materials now can be fully recycled um i think the use of timber um again big advocate for it because it locks in that carbon you know we're growing the trees which which draw in the carbon that carbon is then locked into that timber and for as long as that building's in use that that carbon is held within that that structure as long as we then responsibly recycle reuse that timber at the end of the pro uh, of the building's life um it, it, it's, a, it's a great way to deal with our, our carbon emission issue steel work can be readily recycled. Um, concrete is a little, a little more difficult um, and we can break out the reinforcement from the concrete um, which again can be can be recycled um, but certainly the the, the 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 life carbon emissions of of, of the building and you know, when it comes to demolition should be um, should be considered certainly. Certainly at, at, at that early stage yeah. of design. Um, okay, fantastic. So let's just stick in on more of the sort of technical questions. How has how has technology influenced structural engineering, design and collaboration? Yeah, it's it's, it's had a great impact, huge impact. Um, I've been in the industry for 20 years, as I said, and uh, when I first started, it, everything was in 2D um, in terms of drawing work and also in, in terms of structural modelling, pretty soon into my career, 3D started to really take off. Um, so if we, we talk about structural analysis, for example, um, we can now analyse a building in three dimensions rather than breaking it into its 2D components, which was often the way that we would go. Um, so we can apply wind loads in multi-directions uh, and things like that, which has really helped to be able to create a more efficient structure uh, and a safer structure as well. Um, in terms of um, producing the drawings, um, the, the advent of BIM has helped, I think it, it's helped coordination and collaborative working. Um, I think there's a long way to go with that, um, but it's certainly having a, a positive impact uh, on the industry as a whole. A question probably clients will be quite eager to know. So how do structural engineers balance efficient, effective design with safety? 
Sure. So I think that a term that engineers hear fairly frequently is the term over-engineering, over-engineered. <laughs> And yeah, that was behind the question. <laughs> and, um, and my response to that is often, well, it's over engineered until it isn't. And then when it isn't, there's a problem. Um, and uh, over engineering as a term, I think it's thrown around um, more than it should be. And probably without complete understanding of, um, of some of the reasons that things can be considered as over engineered. There's a, there's a few um, there's a few obvious obvious ones that spring to mind, and that's rationalisation, for example, um, and and if if we have say a, a large frame building, um, there's two options really. We can rationalise the design where we take um, a standard case and we design that case, and then we apply it throughout. And the benefit of that is simplicity, and not for the designer, but for the site team. Really, there's there's no danger of putting something in the wrong place, um, which causes a, a lot of problems and and, and does happen. Um, so that rationalisation can help um, not only the site team, the fabricator, for example. There's there's uh, a, a fairly new um, topic in engineering, which is lean design, uh, and that is to design every single member frame independently of the next so if you imagine a framed building you will end up with each frame maybe contain different size sections for example if we think of a, a portal frame in a warehouse each one of those may be slightly different a different weight um, and obviously the benefit of that is you keep the steel weight down to an absolute minimum the the problem that may come from that is that each individual frame and their, their connection differ from the next which may may cause problems um on site it's not to say that that isn't the way to go i think it is um i just i do think it needs to be considered um before we go into that um another uh, another reason that i think the the term over engineering is used can be um, engineers you know we've been in the game quite a long time we've seen a lot of things and we we do tend to be able to foresee issues that may arise on site and we know that by maybe adding um, let's say 20 mil extra on a floor joist um, we might be able to get over those problems. Something like a wall spanning, uh, a span between walls might increase for, for whatever reason, or there, there might be uh, an applied load that we can foresee that's maybe outside the defined load, but we know that it might be coming. There might be a, there might be a temporary load case that um, we consider the stacking of plasterboard on site, for example, that often gets put on the first floor in excess of the the actual design load so in, these things need to be considered and engineers do take that kind of holistic approach to design um, and that can sometimes be I think misunderstood as maybe um, yeah over engineering and and using more material than is required okay thanks for clearing that up Last technical question, I promise. Um, clear one up for us. So why do client um, employed structural engineers not do connection designs? That's it. It's interesting. We do do connection designs. Um, it's something that we offer as a service. It's often pulled out of the steel design because the fabricator will have his preferred methods of joining two bits of steel together. So us as structural engineers can say um, end plates and and continuous welds and the like, whereas a fabricator knows there's efficiency in fabrication um, of using um, maybe a fin plate, maybe a hit miss weld, this kind of thing. So we often let the fabricator take the lead on that because the fabricator and their connection designer um, has their own preference but as i say awa can take it in the house if if needs be brilliant so you've been in the industry 20 years what changes have you seen in the structural engineering profession i think one of the 
largest changes in terms of the design practices of an engineer is the production of calculations. Um, when I first started, I know that there was a lot of paper around the office, uh, a lot of pencils, um, uh, and that t has, has tended to be replaced now by um, kind of pro forma documentation, um, also spreadsheets and other design software. Um, and this is great for efficiency, can be great for efficiency, um, because the repetition of calculation is something that's it's kind of unnecessary, it's kind of time that could be best spent elsewhere. Um, however, I am a big advocate for hand calculation at the outset of someone's career. Um, I often speak with our graduates and make sure that they've done you know, a fair amount of hand calculation before they move on to the design softwares because the, I think there's a tendency to get there a little bit too quick and hand calculation does make sure that you are fully understanding each element of the calculation. You know, what affects what and, and the factors that, that, that affect the ultimate answer. Um, so that that's one of the huge changes and I, th I think that goes hand in hand with um, with the drawing side of things and it wasn't quite drawing boards when I started <laughs> um, but there, there was there was more hand drawing going on around the office again big advocate for hand sketching and um, I, I still do it myself and I think that it's a skill that I really don't want the industry to lose because to be able to produce a hand sketch in two minutes um, rather than having to to, to to, to knock up a, a CAD detail, for example, where you do tend to get carried away with the millimetres when actually the fundamentals of the connection detail or, or the junction are what's needed, not, not, not drawing to that precise measure. I think that that's been a big change, but as, as, a, as has the hand calculation, but like I say, I think that the industry should hold on to those skills. Um, we don't want them to be completely lost. Well, you'll be pleased to know I still have a scale rule and a calculator in my top drawer. It's great to hear. The abacus went last year. <laughs> um, okay, so look, look, moving on, that, that was really good insight there. So, so moving on, AWA, any sort of interesting projects you've been involved in in the past? Anything you're sort of proud of that the, that yourself personally or the company's delivered? Yeah, sure. We've got we've we've completed a few interesting ones. We've got a few interesting ones on site at the moment. Um, one that springs to mind that's just recently finished and been handed over is um, is Fleet Church. Now, Fleet Church was unfortunately um, subject to an arson attack, um, and was that the whole roof was lost. The, the 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 masonry and the brickwork survived, thankfully. Um, but we took that um, we took that structure and uh, essentially gave it back to the congregation, um, which was. It was a great thing to do, you know, a real sense of achievement in that. Um, and we were responsible for yeah, reinstating the roof. We used glue laminated timber trusses and frameworks to, to put the roof back together. Um, there's some really talented people on board that um, that restored the brickwork. Um, and it, it really looks like a, a, a stunning church has been restored to its former glory. Um, one project that we've got running at the moment is... Um, is Ride Tramway Pier, which on the Isle of Wight, which um, is the restoration of, of, of the old pier um, at, at Ride. Um, so it, it's actually a third pier in between the rail pier and the the the, the promenade that takes the the cars to the to the ferry port at the end. There, there's now going to be a central pier, which um, is for pedestrians and cycles, and that's um, that's what we're responsible for. That's interesting, tidal working, um, marine environments, lots to think about. But um, yeah, we're kind of 80% of the way through that one. Really excited to um, to see that finish. Thank you, Mark. Mark, look, you've given a really great insight into structural engineering. For anyone who's maybe looking to come into the, into the, uh, the profession, into the construction industry, as well as those working in there, you know, some of the sort of technical stuff you've, you've discussed. So... I think that's been really great, and thank you, thank you very much for today. Um, is there anything that I haven't covered that would be worthy of noting in terms of structure engineering or what you guys do? Anything else you want to sort of mention? Uh, I think I'd just like to finish off by kind of really selling 
the the occupation, the profession of structural engineering. It's um, it's one I think unlike any other in terms of what you can be doing from from day to day. I touched on earlier, um, you know, going from a, a church to a marina, and uh, I fondly remember uh, a, a couple of years ago there was there was a week I actually did a LinkedIn post on this where I'd been to inspect uh, a church bell tower and then to an industrial unit and then to an RNLI lifeboat station and then I was uh, underneath the tide mill looking at some issues that they were having there and I can't think of a, a, a profession where you would get that level of diversity um, and that, it, it's just it's just a, such a, a really interesting profession to be in um, and I'd recommend it to anyone that's got an interest in problem solving in in numbers. Um, but I I've, I'd advise that the numerical side of engineering is just one arm. I think a, a lot of people can see that you know we're number crunchers, but there's a lot of practicality. There's a lot of site visits. There's there's a lot of you know boots on the ground, touching and feeling things as well as um, you know then putting the design together based on what you've seen so yeah just just want to take the opportunity to, to to really recommend the profession to anyone that's thinking that you know what I've said today is is of interest to them um and uh yeah that's uh it, it's, it's a really uh, good profession to be in thank you Mark that's that's great that's a really nice way to 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 end this video so thank you for your time today it's very much appreciated thanks Jamie so thank you for watching this video. I hope you found some value in the content and enjoyed watching it. If you have any questions, please do not hesitate to contact us and we really look forward to hearing from you.